welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. I am Alan, and today we're talking about lens fungus. When we talk about fungus infesting our lenses, what we're actually talking about is a growth of mold inside and sometimes outside the glass elements of our lenses. And what makes mold different from most of the fungus you're probably familiar with it, it has a mass of these tiny little tubules that spread out from a spore. And it all begins with the spores and different species have different size spores. And while most modern camera lenses uh, are sealed in such a way that the bigger spores can't get through, it's certainly still possible to get spores in a lens. There's one argument that says that any, any mold that uh, exists inside a camera lens was put there when the lens was made, which I think is, is rubbish. Uh, we pump air into and out of some of our uh, telephoto zoom lenses constantly. Getting Getting um, uh, a spore into your lens is no more challenging than getting a dust particle. But there are a couple of things though that most of the common molds that, that are gonna bother a camera lens, there are a couple of things they have to have. There are a, a few requirements they have to grow inside a lens. The typical molds that grow in lenses require quite a bit of moisture. To, to live. They also need a substrate. They also need something to eat. A lot of the nutrients that, that molds were able to access were from the organic lubricants and some of the some of the organic lens coatings that are used on some of the interior elements of a lens. But they could even be uh, eating the dust that got pulled into the lens when the spore did. And maybe you're wondering, well, where do you get these spores from? Well, the truth is that spores uh, for most of these molds is truly ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It's in the air we breathe, but they're everywhere. You can't avoid coming in contact with them. So how do we protect our lenses from providing a, a, a nice habitat for, for fungus to grow? But we're getting ahead of ourselves because while the second part of this video is going to be to show you exactly in detail what I do to protect my lenses, I thought first we could talk about how to find out if your lenses have mold in them. For, for most of us, the, the time you need to check for lens mold is when you buy the lens. And I recommend you do this whether you're buying a brand new lens from Japan or you're picking something up on eBay that's been around for 50 years. You need to check your optics. What I do when I have a lens that I haven't had a good look at, I buy these little plastic boxes um, from, uh, I don't know where I got them from, but I like them because they're relatively clear, but not completely clear and they're very sturdy. What I'll do is I'll just take a cheap flashlight that has a, a flat base on it and I'll turn it on. I'll put it inside the, the box where it'll sit and I'll put the lid back on. This will allow me to have my hands free to examine the lens, usually using a, a second flashlight to see the parts of the lens that aren't well illuminated. With this setup, you are gonna be able to see every element in the lens. And uh, what we're looking for when we examine a lens like this is a very characteristic growth around the edge of the lens. There are more than just the two elements that you can see. There's more than the front element and the rear element. Uh, depending on the lens, it's going to have 16 other pieces of glass in there or more. So what you need to do is pay attention to each layer. You can tell where the uh, one element stops and another one begins. If your lens is old, which is the lens you really need to be checking for fungus, 
you usually have a manual aperture which allows you to open the aperture all the way up and just leave it alone. The open aperture will let all the light in from below and allow you to get into all the corners from above. If you have a more modern lens, modern lenses generally don't have an aperture ring. And when they're on the camera, there's a, there's a servo motor. I think that's the right word. There's a motor anyway inside the camera that moves a little tab uh, one way or the other to change the size of the aperture, move the blades in and out. Now, they all have this. I don't know if Canon or Fuji or any of the other brands are significantly different from Nikon, but in Nikon, there's always this little black tab. And the, the trick is to just secure it in the open position when you're examining the lens, and that'll allow you to see all of the elements front and back. And that can be done just with a tiny little bit of black tape. I say black because it's the tape I use. It's a gorilla something or other, but it sticks like crazy. Just be super careful that you don't get any adhesive from the tape onto other parts of your lens. So just a tiny little strip is all it will take to hold that little plunger out of the way. You might wonder, well, what kind of problems does a little bit of fungus in the lens cause? Well, the first thing is it, it keeps growing. It will keep growing until that entire lens element uh, becomes opaque with, with uh, uh, mold and you can't use it anymore. But usually it just gives you a gradually enlarging soft area in your photographs that gets more and more noticeable. Well, as soon as you know about it, you won't be able to stop seeing it. Why am I talking about finding mold and then preventing mold and not discussing fixing it in the middle? Well, for a couple of good reasons. First of all, you can't. No matter what anybody tells you, you can't you can't ever get a lens back to where it was if it's if it's in infested with mold. The reason for that is the, the parts of the lens, you're often going to find this on are the parts of the lens that have special coatings, whether, whether it's coatings to, to reduce the, you know, color fringing or other aberrations, that may be one of the food sources that the, uh, that the fungus is using. The other thing is molds as they grow secrete acid liquids from, from their uh, hyphae, from their cells, that can literally etch the glass. I read something about uh, the, the hyphae growing between the coating uh, and the glass element itself, though I haven't been able to confirm. It would make sense because if they're eating the coating, they're going to be burrowing into it. The point is this. No matter what you do, there is physical damage that has been done to the lens by the mold. It's not just mold sitting on the lens. So fixing it will cost you a fortune. You'll never be happy with it. Has been my experience. I bought an expensive lens that was quite old. It had a fungus problem. I really wanted the lens because it was rare. And uh, I sent it off for a month and a half to, to get it fixed. And it came back with no visible mold in it and a, a terrible picture, just really soft on the side that the, that the fungus had been growing. So, yeah, you, you take your chances. Uh, I've seen videos on YouTube of people unscrewing the lens, pulling the lens out, washing it in soap and water, and then scrubbing it down with a with a piece of kitchen paper and then putting it back in the lens. Well, more power to you. I don't recommend you do that, especially not with, uh, with your new 2470. Let's talk about preventing mold problems. This is important. Now, the key environmental factor that we need to control is the humidity that we store our lenses in. The average comfortable humidity in a home is probably 65, 70 percent. 
That's a lot of water vapor. But the more humid the air is, the more likely you're going to get fungus and mold growing on other things too. But for lenses, most of the literature would suggest that the common molds that destroy lenses are intolerant of humidity that's less than about 40%. The humidity of less than 40% can be obtained and maintained in a really simple enclosure. So what I'm going to describe is a way to get peace of mind, especially when you're storing lenses that you may only use occasionally. I have a bunch of lenses, specialty lenses that I use for specific projects, but I don't take them out every month or every two months. So they are sitting undisturbed. And that's one of the other things mold likes. They don't like moving air. They don't like ultraviolet light. So having the camera out and using it without a UV filter, of course, is one of the ways that, that, you, can, that you can cut down on the likelihood. Storing for long periods of time is not good. Uh, and, and will, if the humidity is high enough, it'll expose you to that risk. So how do we how do we control the humidity? The first thing you're going to need is a container. This is this is the container I use. I'm going to make a second one because I've outgrown my first one. What makes this container unique? Uh, well, not unique, what makes it ideal for, for this job is that around the rim, it has a closed cell foam insulator. And this actually does seal moisture from the container um, quite effectively, I found. Uh, so that's the first thing you're gonna need. Once your lenses are in there, how can you keep the humidity in that chamber below the humidity in your house. So we're gonna to need to use what's called a desiccant. The most common desiccant is silica gel. So what I recommend doing is, is selecting a, a desiccant or a dehumidifier uh, that, that comes in containers like these that will allow you to, to keep the the silica gel from falling all over the place in your enclosure. These are just little me perforated metal tins that are full of the, the uh, silica gel uh, crystals or spheres. Now, the other thing that you need to make sure of when you buy silica gel, make sure you're buying the kind of gel that can be reactivated. That's very, very important. Otherwise, you'll use this until it's absorbed all the water it can and you'll have to throw it away. These are uh, rechargeable, which means when you can tell when the, the silica has absorbed as much water as it's going to because it changes color. They have a little window in them so that you can see the color of the, the, uh, the silica. I generally take the lid off these boxes and actually have a good look at the silica to tell when it's absorbed all the water it's going to. And then you just um, uh, bung the thing in the oven. Um, I think it's about 250 degrees for two or three hours and it will completely remove all the moisture in the gel. You put it back in the, in the uh, tin, seal it and put it back in your, your container. Now, I even took a picture of this to make sure that you understand that you need to close these things with a piece of my black Gorilla Tape, or your black Gorilla Tape will do just as well. The reason is, it, this thing has got thousands or hundreds, thousands probably of tiny little beads inside it, and they get everywhere if the, if the lid pops open, and I've had one pop open. Uh, so it's a good idea to tape them shut when you're using them. That's a pro tip. <laughs> so you can buy them uh, in, in sets of uh, a couple for a, a little less money. It's always a good idea. Uh, have a careful examination of them when you get them. 
uh, and uh, make sure that they are fully charged or fully dehydrated before you put them in your system. These plastic packages get holes in them and they will gather moisture depending on how long they've been on the shelf. There are, there are two different kinds of, um, well, there are more than two, but there is one kind of silica gel that contains a, a cobalt um, salt. So I would recommend you look for cobalt free silica gel. It'll say, uh, it'll say it on Amazon or wherever you're looking for it. So that's how we dry the air. And that's where we dry the air. Now we need to ask, how are we going to measure the humidity? How are we going to know our chamber is working? How are we going to know when it's time to recharge the, uh, the silica gel? To do that, you need to have a uh, monitor system. You need to have a measurement of the humidity inside the chamber. And it needs to be assembled in such a way that it's not measuring the humidity on the outside of the chamber, because a lot of them, a lot of them do. A lot of them, the, the digital uh, hygrometers, that's what they're called, humidity meters are called hygrometers. I recommend getting mechanical rather than electrical hygrometers. And I'll tell you where I, where I uh, get that uh, opinion from. My dehumidifier in the house is an expensive dehumidifier and it's very accurate. And it's been factory checked for accuracy. So it is constantly reading the humidity in the environment. So I know in this room what the current humidity is. And I have tested and checked just about every cheap variety of, uh, of, of uh, hygrometer on the market. That's not true. There's millions of them. I've tried a bunch of them. And I have had the most luck with out of the box accuracy with probably the cheapest hygrometer that I have ever tested. Now, obviously the way you test it is you look at the humidity on the dehumidifier, then you look at the humidity on whatever your device is reading. Now, right out of the box, a lot of the cheap digital ones will be off by 10 or, or 15%, which is ridiculous. No use at all. Some of the ones that they, uh, uh, that they sell for use in um, uh, humidors, cigar boxes. Um, in cigar boxes, they're trying to keep the humidity up, but they also need a, a measure to see where it is all the time. I bought this one last week um, to, to give it a look. And um, as is so often the case with an Amazon purchase, it had already been used um, when I got it. And it is reading about 20% uh, below the actual humidity in the room. So this one, though it is certainly cute, I like the, the gold and white dial, it would have looked good in my dehumidifier box, but it's crap as far as accuracy of uh, the device. This goes back. But the one that I have used, the one I have on my other box, and the one I think I would buy again in the in the future without hesitation was a $4 hygrometer mechanical that I bought at a pet shop. You go to the reptile section. It's very important that reptiles are kept in the, the right humidity too. This is what I would recommend. Now, it comes with a, a bit of um, a Velcro-like material on the back which isn't going to serve our purpose here because we don't we don't want to to sit this thing facing into the box we want to have it facing out of the box and also the air inlet is at the base uh, so i think plastering this against a flat surface could limit the the air intake so what i recommend you do is bury these through the wall of your um, humid, uh, your, your humidity blocked storage case. 
Let me explain what I mean by that. This thing has a smaller diameter on the, the inside part than it does on the flange. So ideally, we would place this thing through, let me use this smaller lid to show you what I mean. We could place this uh, device through the, the, the wall of the chamber so that it would come out on the inside, be held in position and not have any leakage of air around it. It's that, it's basically that simple. Now, I keep my, my lens boxes on the shelf in a particular way. So I have the narrow face facing out just because it fits in my shelf that way. So I don't want to have to move the box to find out what the humidity is. So I will place, I'll place my hygrometer right in the middle of the face that faces me. So I can see from across the room that we're okay. Um, and uh, this is the one I'm going to use. So let me walk you through the process. Um, it's, it's about as simple a, a DIY process as you're going to see. Things you're going to need to have at hand are some kind of measuring device. Um, you're going to need a drill, either a cordless drill or a uh, corded one, doesn't make any difference. The one thing you might have to buy, and if you live in America, go to Harbor Freight, because you'll get these for next to nothing, is a set of um, hole drills. A hole drill consists of a, a regular drill on the inside called the mandrel, and then around the outside, a toothed cup. They come in sets, and it's important to have a set in case your, uh, your, your uh, meter is of a different size. They come in an assortment of sizes. I think there's about eight or 10 uh, sizes in here for $10, which is a, a deal. I'll, I'm sure I'll use these things again. There's one other tool that you need, and that is a hot glue gun. This is a hot, hot glue gun, meaning I've already plugged it in and it's boiling. Uh, I've also got a block, a, a stick of glue mounted in it, ready to go. Okay, that's all you need. That's it, that's all there is to it. So first thing you do is grab your meter and your ruler or your micrometer or whatever you have and measure the outside diameter of the, of, oh dear. So grab your broken hydrometer, hygrometer and uh, measure the outside diameter at, its, at the widest point of the inner piece. And it comes out to uh, 1.7 inches. And the narrower part at the top is the same. So hang on, that must be a straight line. It is, okay, brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. So it's um, 1.7 inches, which is one and five eighths. So a key, tip here would be to, to use a smaller rather than a larger drill bit. If you don't have a drill bit that's exactly the same size, I recommend drilling the hole a little bit smaller because you can always use a, a heat gun or a little file to enlarge the hole just a little bit. The way this thing works is it is going to drill its own guide hole. So while in the perfect world, you'd do this on a drill press where the drill would follow a, a precise course. I don't have a drill press anymore and uh, I'm just gonna do this by hand. Now, one of the problems with plastic when you drill it is it can crack. So to do this properly, I highly recommend that you Clamp a board to your work surface so that the box can sit 
on a firm board while you're drilling against it. Otherwise, there's too much give and you're more likely to slip. So you could also drill a pilot hole if you wanted to, but I'm just going to start drilling from here. And as you can see, it just cuts right through the plastic. Now, as you get close to the surface of the plastic, you want to slow your drill and just gradually scratch the surface. You want to just scratch the surface of the uh, plastic without much force. There you have it. There's the, the disc of plastic. You can see it's cut a very, very smooth hole. Perfect. Okay. It gets hot. So, so be careful that you don't want to have a lot of melted plastic building up around the, the edges. So that's how you drill the hole. Now all we have to do is attach the device. So there is a tiny rim of melted plastic at the, at the inside of the hole, but I'm not going to worry about that. It just actually increases the surface area that's going to be glued to the hygrometer. So the next step is to just carefully apply the glue around the flange. So with glue all around, make sure it's positioned upright and drop it into the hole. Well, as you can see, it's a very simple uh, preventive measure that you can take, even though with modern equipment, a really significant uh, mold infestation in a lens is an unusual event. Most of the time it's going to be old lenses, but if you're like me and collect old lenses, this is, this is something you should pay attention to. And building one of these took 10 minutes and under $10. And with that, I can rest assured that uh, any lenses that don't come to me with, with mold aren't going to get it from me. I've mentioned this a couple of times. I'm going to mention it again. Uh, I am collecting photographs, one or two, usually macro photographs, that you guys have taken that you're particularly proud of, especially if you did it using one of our uh, macro recommendations for lighting or, or uh, using in larger lenses, anything like that. If you've, uh, uh, if you've got a picture or two that you'd like to share with uh, other members of the channel, other subscribers, please send them to me at contact at alanwallsphotography.com. Send me a line or two about you, about where you took the picture, how you took the picture, what you used, that type of stuff. Anything that you think others would be interested to know, maybe where you're from would be good too. And I'm gonna do a, a video uh, just sharing these images from various folks who've been really uh, very involved in, in getting this channel off the ground. So uh, I'd love for you to, to participate in that. I'll give it a couple more weeks before, uh, uh, before I shut that down. But um, yeah, do that. It'll be fun. So I'll be back in a few days. Um, I'm I hit a roadblock with my uh, macro lighting cage, but uh, nothing too important. The shop was closed. So I'll be going back this, this weekend. All right. See you in a few days. Take care. Bye-bye.